session 12 and today we continue with Exodus chapter 8. We ended yesterday with um, the magician saying this is the finger of God himself. So we know who we are dealing with, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And now we continue with this battle between the God of Genesis, the God of the Bible and, and his um, relationship with his bride and his battle with Pharaoh, the Antichrist, the dark kingdom, the, the whole world system that is against him and his people. Verse 20 and 21. So Yahuwah said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. See, he comes forth to the waters and say to him, This says Yahuwah, let my people go, that they may serve me. Or else, Pharaoh, if you will not let my people go, See, I will send swarms of flies upon you and upon your servants and upon your people and into your house and into the house of all the Egyptians so that it shall be full with swarms of flies and also the ground where they are. Listen, there's nothing I hate more than flies. Um, in the physical, a fly is something that sits on um, on poop, on dung. They, they like all the frot decaying things and also not to forget that a fly in in the physical is part of God's creation how strong and clever has he been from the beginning after sin entered the world and because of sin death comes but when something dies you know it's it's going to stink and it's going to uh, frot on the ground so God has all the little creatures that he made you know all the unclean animals and all the unclean insects that's also part of God's creation he created them not because they are unclean and because they are um, you know filthy but he made that especially to clean up the the earth um, the unclean sea animals to clean up the oceans so it's beautiful how God is looking after the whole ecosystem but in the spiritual flies represent something else flies represent dung it represents excretion it represents everything that is false um, rubbish doctrine right because if we look at swarms of flies and, and we just think and meditate a bit on the fly part of it I just want to take you to the New Testament Matthew 10 verse 25 it is enough for the disciples that he be as his master and the servant to be as his Lord if they had called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Here Yeshua is talking about, you know, um, the times of the disciples, but also prophesying about the end times. How people um, of this world, how the strangers and even people from your own family will persecute his disciples for his name. Um, and everybody that is against this um, <laughs> system of God everyone that's against his way of life his instructions his holiness everyone that that thinks they are serving God by persecuting God's disciples are here by Yeshua called um, servants of Beelzebub now what is Beelzebub we are busy with the swarms of flies in the first um, uh, exodus where the plagues are falling and, and the flies is a plague. If you had your whole house full of flies, you will know exactly <laughs> what a plague they are. And so is the false doctrine of this world system. So is the Antichrist with, um, with him pretending to be as God, sitting in the temple of God and, you know, at the end of the times, forcing people to worship him instead of God. But now, instead of forcing people, he's deceiving people into worshipping him. And he's called Beelzebub. There's only two entities. You've only got the almighty God of the Bible. And you've got the mighty, not almighty, but the mighty Antichrist of the Bible. So there's only the, the, the real Messiah and the false Messiah. The real God and the anti-God. And here, one of the names given to the anti-God is Beelzebub beautifully showing us the fly system because why in um, Greek 
Beelzebub, the name that Yeshua uses, is um, from the root word uh, Beelzebul, and it's got a Chaldean origin. It means the dung god, the god of dung, the god of poop, <laughs> the god of excretion. It's one of the names of Satan. You know, he sits on his throne, and like God's throne, God sits on the mercy seat of his throne. And the foundation of God's throne is his Torah. The, the instructions of his kingdom is the foundations of his throne. What is Beelzebub sitting on? He's sitting on a dung heap. <laughs> He's surrounded by flies, by a plague, by dirty, unclean little things that that's polluting everything. Flies are dirty and they take their dirt all over. <coughs> And they come into your house and onto your food and they just, um, what is the right word? They pollute everything, just like Satan's um, servants, uh, the false prophets. They, they pollute every aspect of life. The, the two root words for Beelzebub is Baal Zebub, right? So Baal, you know, already means Lord. Zebub is... Um, the root word for fly, um, it's especially showing towards one of those stinging flies, you know, the, the stierkvlieg. It's also um, a fly not only that's dirty, but it, it also can sting you. So zebub means the stinging fly and Baal means Lord. So Beelzebub is the Lord of the flies and Yeshua prophesies that the Lord of the flies will be the ones in Matthew 10 that is persecuting his disciples. And those that persecute his disciples of the human race, whether it's um, strangers or the government or the false religious system or even members of your own family. Because Yeshua explains that even people from your own house will turn against you and deliver you up for persecution. Um, they are called servants of Beelzebub. It's, I'm not trying to be funny, but I'm trying to, to, to make the correlation between this plague in the first Exodus and to see how it correlates to the plagues of the last final Exodus. And here Yeshua is confirming that, that those who persecute the people from the way, the people that is um, living in the, the truth of God, <clears throat> um, will be called um, servants of this Baal, Zebub, Beelzebub. Um, Beelzebub, Satan, the serpent, is the lord of dung. And there's flies around this heap of dung. So this lord of the flies uh, and, and all the little flies that's swarming all over the place, these are the people who persecute the truth and believe the lies. They are like flies on dung and they distribute whatever they get from this dung heap. They're eating from the tree of knowledge and they distribute that dung, that rubbish religion. They distribute that all over the world. The master of the dung heap is the father of lies, the serpent himself. He started his rubbish dung lie religion in the Garden of Eden. He started this whole false doctrine worship system, not only um, you know deceiving people, but but also creating all these other kinds of religions and atheism and evolution, and um, people that that follow their brain rather than their heart. People that say they can't have faith in a God that allows evil things to happen. Or they rather believe in the power of the universe than in the God of Abraham. You know, there's, there's so many aspects to this false religion. And that is what the flies is distributing. That's why the flies is so symbolic of one of the gods of Egypt. But also God uses the flies against Egypt and showing that his um, creation is stronger than those false gods of Egypt. But in the, in the spiritual, those unclean flies represents 
how the false doctrine is is just taken up into your house, into your ovens like the frogs, the unclean spirits, um, onto your people and onto your servants and onto your children and into your into your kitchen everywhere. So, how do we? as God's people, ensure that we don't eat from the dung heap? How do we avoid the flies? Well, God has the answer. Back to Exodus um, chapter 8, verse 22. Listen to this. But I will separate in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell. No swarms of flies shall be there. So that you may know that I am Yahuwah in the midst of the earth. Can you see how we can make sure that we don't eat from this dung heap? We go away from the dung heap. We turn away from the tree of knowledge, of deception, and we turn towards God. And God himself will separate his people, exactly like he did in Egypt. <clears throat> the swarms of flies were all over Egypt. But not even one fly came to the land of Goshen. God says specifically that he will separate his people in Goshen from the people of Egypt. Why does he do that? So that everybody will know that he is Yahuwah, the God from the tree of life. So when God says he will separate his people, separate is, you know, S-E-P-A-R-A-T-E. But if you... um, you know, a skommel, if you just um, um, change the order of the words, you get the word set apart, which means exactly the same. To, to be separate from something um, means to be set apart from it. And that word set apart in Hebrew is kadosh, and it's translated in your Bibles as holy. So God will make holy his people, and that's how his people will be distinguished from the fly system. That's how we will know that we are not um, being misled by the Antichrist. Because when we come into God's holiness and into his holy law, as Paul says in Romans, we'll get to that now, we are set apart, we are separated, we are different than all the other nations and all the other peoples. Because we follow the God of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And Abram had to come out of Babylon, out of Chaldea, the, um, out of Ur, the land of the Chaldeans. He had to come out of that system. And God separated Abram for himself. And then he separated Abram's seed for himself. Deuteronomy 32 from verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance... When he separated the sons of Adam, because out of Adam came Seth and eventually Noah and eventually Abraham, and that's how he separated his people. God set the bounds of all the people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. And who is his people? Deuteronomy 32 verse 9. Jacob. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Jacob is the lot of God's inheritance. This is who his people is. And I don't have to remind you, but we're not talking about the Jews only. You know by now that the ten northern tribes is scattered into the Gentile nations. But out of the Gentile nations, when we return to God, we are returning to Israel. Deuteronomy um, 32 verse 10. He found Jacob in a desert land. And in the waste howling wilderness, he led him out of Egypt. He instructed him. He gave him his Torah. And he kept Jacob as the apple of his eye. This is how God separates. First of all, he finds you because if you realize you're in a desert land and you start longing for God, he promises like I've shown you so many times in Deuteronomy 4 when you are um, scattered within the Gentile nations and you return to God and you obey his voice and you look for him, he will make that you find him. But he's also the one finding us and looking for us and sending his Ruach to speak to us and sending us his word so that we can follow that and come out of Egypt. He leads us out, says verse 10, and he instructs us. 
He instructs us so we can, we can distinguish between eating from the dung heap of the Lord of the Flies and eating from the tree of life. And he keeps us as the apple of his eye because we are his bride. We, we mustn't forget that. Um, the bride was made from Adam's rib. Like that, Yeshua was pierced in his side for his bride. And remember, like um, in Abraham's time, um, Pharaoh took Abraham's wife. It's like this Antichrist wants to take God's bride. And God hit Pharaoh with plagues. And Pharaoh um, called Abraham and said, you know, just take your wife and go. Exactly the same here. Pharaoh has God's bride in captivity. And God is bringing all these plagues on Pharaoh so that Pharaoh can tell Moses, just take God's bride and just go. And also prophetic, the Antichrist system still today has God's bride in captivity. And God is going to destroy this Antichrist. And he's going to um, let, his, let God's bride go through through the sun that got pierced in his side, where the bride was taken out from, from this ribcage of Adam, the bride is coming in. And God is jealous for his bride. <laughs> he's, he's not going to allow any um, stupid man to, to steal his bride. He's fighting. God is fighting for you and for me. He's fighting for his bride and he's bringing everything. And, and we're going to see in the future, he's going to bring these plagues and he's going to destroy the man that has been killing and deceiving um, his bride. And he's going to bring us out. He's going to instruct us and he's going to keep us as the apple of his eye. Because that is what God does. Abraham had to go into Egypt because of a famine. Remember, Israel went to Egypt because of a famine. And we are also in Egypt working under this uh, economic system because otherwise we'll die of hunger, right? But at the end of the day, this system is not our Lord. Beelzebub is not our master. God Almighty himself is. Beautiful foreshadows and pictures all over the Bible. So um, 1 Kings 8 verse 53. For God, you did separate Israel from among all the people of the earth. He's, he's confirming what Deuteronomy says. You've taken Israel as your inheritance. And you've spoken by the hand of Moses, your servant. And you brought Israel out of Egypt. Beautiful. Can you see how um, the rest of the Bible just explains to us what God meant when he said, I will separate my people from amongst all the Egyptians, from amongst all the people of the earth. They all have their places where, where they live and where they can worship their false gods, but I'm going to separate my people. Matthew 25 verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all the nations, but he shall separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates his sheep from the goats. Beautiful. I love this whole Bible study of separation, holiness. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Therefore come out from among them. Right? Just like Israel had to come out from amongst the Egyptians. And be separate. Be separate, says Yahuwah. What does it mean to be separate? Well, we have to know the instructions from the tree of life so that we don't eat from the dung heap. And here Paul explains beautifully in 2 Corinthians 16 verse 17. He says, Come out from them, be separate, says Yahuwah, and touch not the unclean thing. How do we know what is clean and unclean? How do we know not to touch the dung heap? How do we know not to touch the unclean things? We only know it by the set of rules of instructions. His holy law. He says, don't touch the unclean thing and I then can receive you, says God. God cannot take us when we are still, um, when dung and uncleanness and Torahlessness and sin is still clinging to us. He can, only, he can only take us as his inheritance when we go through repentance of our sin, of our breaking his law, and we come into that holy 
covenant that he's making with his people, not with the nations. People must come out of the nations into Israel and then he can receive them. Because um, Paul continues, he says in Romans 7 verse 12, the law is set apart. Go read your Bible. Your, your translation probably says holy. But just open your e-sword or any of your concordances and click on holy and you'll find the word set apart. Um, Paul says your commandment is holy, set apart. Your commandments are good and just. Because he remember he says in 2 Corinthians, we mustn't touch the unclean thing. We must be set apart to God. And then he helps us to understand how we can do that because he says the law is set apart. And when we keep the law, we are set apart. We are different to all the Egyptians. Can you see that? Verse 23. And I will put a division between my people and your people. Can you see that division, that set apartness? How does God make his people in this world Amongst all these nations and all these religions and all these false prophets, how does he make his people set apart? He puts a division between them. Physically here, there was a division between Goshen and Egypt. Spiritually, the holy or kadosh or separation between God's people and the rest of the world's people is a sign. What sign? God says in verse 23 of Exodus 8, I'll put a, a, a division between my people and your people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. So what happened tomorrow in, in Moses' time was when the swarms of flies came unto Egypt, but not unto God's people. All right? So there's a sign for the world so that they can see who is God's people and who's not God's people. God's people are the ones that doesn't receive the, um, f the dung, the rubbish, the poop, the flies and the Lord of the flies. All right? There's a specific sign on God's people that makes them separated from the rest of the world. What is that sign? How are we different? How are we separated from this world? By wearing his sign, by taking his sign, by accepting God's sign. What is God's sign? I, I cannot tell you. Um, who am I to give my opinion? That's why we have to ask God himself. And God tells us in Ezekiel 20 verse 12 and 20 verse 20, Hello my Sabbaths, not only the seventh day Sabbath, but all the holy Sabbaths, all the feasts. And where again? Uh, do we find how to hallow, how to keep holy, how to keep separate his Sabbaths? Where do we find that? We find that, according to Romans 7 verse 12, in the holy law, in the set-apart law. All right, God says, Hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between you and me, that you may know that I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Remember God um, said through Moses to Pharaoh, um, I will separate my people from your people. Um, no swarms of flies will come upon my people so that you may know that I'm Yahuwah, your Elohim. And now he tells his people to hallow his Sabbath days. It shall be a sign between them, between us and him, so that we may know that he is Yahuwah, our Elohim. Beautiful. But there is another sign. There's the sign of the opposition. All right, let me read that to you. The curses or the signs of disobedience. And this is in Deuteronomy 28, verse uh, 45. All these curses will come upon you. These curses will overtake you and pursue you until you are destroyed. Since you do not obey Yahuwah your Elohim. And since you do not keep his commandments and the statutes he gave you. These curses will be a? sign can you hear that the curses for disobedience on the lord of the flies and all his little insects all his flies that's eating from the dung heap those people that don't obey god and that eats from the dung heap and do not eat from the tree of life there'll be a sign on them as well what is the sign on them the curses the plagues 
the wrath of God, the judgment, that will be the sign that they are not his people and they are not separated. These curses will be a sign and a wonder upon you and your descendants forever because you don't want to serve Yahuwah with joy and gladness of heart. But for those that want to serve Yahuwah with joy and gladness, we wear the sign of being glad on his Sabbath days and being um, glad by following his ways, his commandments. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. Um, back to Exodus 8, verse 24. Um, so Yahuwah said he will put a division, right? So Yahuwah did so. And there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, blah, blah, blah. Pharaoh called for Moses and say, go and sacrifice to your Elohim in the land. And Moses said, it is not right to do so, for we would be sacrificing the abomination of the Egyptians to Yahuwah, our Elohim. See, shall we sacrifice the abominations of the Egyptians before their eyes and they will not stone us? We will go, therefore, three days' journey into the wilderness, and there we will sacrifice to Yahuwah, our Elohim, as he commanded us. All right, so what does this mean? Um, remember the Egyptians worshipped animals. Remember the statue of the golden calf, how um, Israel made a, an image of the golden calf as they learned from the Egyptians and they said, this is Yahuwah. We're making something that we say is Yahuwah, although it's not. That's a whole Christmas tree thing again. But they, they learned making statues from the Egyptians because the Egyptians worshipped animals. And a, another way of saying, will we sacrifice the abomination of the Egyptians? The Egyptians are using the cattle as idols and as gods. So that's why it's an abomination. And if Egypt, uh, sorry, if, if the Hebrews had to start um, sacrificing their calves and, and sheep and stuff to Yahuwah, the Egyptians would stone them, said Moses. That's why they don't want to do it in front of the Egyptians. They want to go out into the wilderness, three days journey. They want to do it there separated from the Egyptians on their own, only between them and their God. So verse 28. Um, verse, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 28. So Pharaoh said, All right, I'll let you go, that you may sacrifice to Yahweh your Elohim in the wilderness. Only you cannot go very far away. <laughs> Pharaoh said, it's fine, you can go, but no, 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 you, you're not going to go far. You can just go a little way. All right. <laughs> the false Messiah will sometimes allow people to come a little bit out from under his spell of deceit. But he doesn't want to let you go very far. He doesn't want to allow the ground on which the seed falls to become too soft. He wants to keep control. Although it might look like you are coming out from under the system or from out from under the tree of knowledge, out from under deception, he doesn't want to let you go too far. But we, like Moses, must see that clever plan of, of the Antichrist. And we must say, like Moses, verse 29, no, I'm sorry. I am going to go out from under you. I'm not going to just go out a little way from, from away from you. No, I'm totally going to come out from you. So Moses conf confirms that um, separation is not just a little bit, um, you know, one foot in the desert and another foot still in Egypt. We have to be completely separated from the false god. Not, there isn't something like a little separation. There's nothing like a little bit of holiness and still a little bit in, in the world. You can't be on the narrow road and on the wide road. You, can, you can't be eating from the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. Revelation 3 verse 15. I know your works, says Yeshua, that you are neither cold nor hot. If at least you are cold or hot, but, but now you are just lukewarm. You've got one foot in the world, you've got one foot in deception, and another foot you want to follow in my Torah. He says, because you look warm, you're neither hot nor cold. 
I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. The Greek translation is actually, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I will, I'll, I will become nauseous like, like you're a fly. You come from a dung heap. You make me nauseous and I'm going to vomit you out. No, you have to be burning um, with, with flames of truth. Like, like we discussed, the burning bush, the flames, the burning coals of the Ruach HaKodesh. It has to burn away all the false doctrine. You have to come out of Egypt. You can't just go out a little way. It's, it's not enough to, to just leave a little way. All right? Um, not only do Moses and Aaron bring about the first plague and then remove it. They cause the frogs of the second plague to descend upon Egypt. But Moses now taunts Pharaoh by saying to him, Choose a time when you want the frogs to be destroyed. Right? Remember that from yesterday. So Pharaoh does, he said, tomorrow. And Moses proves his God-given ability and God's power. But after the frogs were taken away, um, Pharaoh's heart were hardened again. And the same is going to be here with the flies. Um, and the question is also, these, these people that are still eating, you know, a little bit from the dung heap, would they, in today's life, would they really be convinced of the reality of God? Um, if somebody performed miracles, like Moses performed miracles, on God's behalf in Egypt. And the the people were awed by it, but after a while their hearts became hardened again and Pharaoh's heart became hardened. Would people in today's life would they turn to God if if the plagues start falling and the separation of God's people is clearly visible? How God will will protect his people and how he's protecting us now from Beelzebub, from the Lord of the Flies, from the false tree of knowledge deception system. Is that enough to convince people of this powerful God? Would people be convinced today if God's reality is shown? Would the conviction and the conviction be permanent? Or after a while would people just become disillusioned again? Or will they just explain all of it away as an illusion? Can miracles be the foundation of an enduring faith? We looked at the false miracles of the um, occult magicians of Egypt and we compared that to the signs and wonders and so-called miracles of the false prophets in the last days. If people are, are still eating from the dung heap, then even miracles will just um, strengthen what is in their heart. <laughs> like Pharaoh's heart were hardened and people's hearts were hard will be hardened in the last days. And if if we don't go with the mainstream, we will be persecuted by these very same people that's eating from the dung heap. And even miracles from the from the false side will convince them that, you know, they are on the right side. And even if you don't take the mark of the beast and you carry the sign of God and you you keep his Sabbath day and all these swarms of flies and the plagues of the last days comes upon the world but not on you, will people be convinced? Will that convict them of their lawlessness and their sins and will they turn to God? That is a question we have to ask ourselves. It's, it's difficult and we can just hope and pray that, that people will look upon this God that is standing up against Egypt and that they will turn to him by looking at how he separates his people. But what we can do best is to continue being separate and allow God to separate us and make us more and more holy every day of our lives. <laughs>